In the previous video, we saw that metals can be extracted in different ways, depending on how reactive they are. Now, iron is a metal which is less reactive than carbon, and we can see that by looking at our reactivity series. And so here we have carbon, and below it is iron. So iron can be displaced by carbon. Iron will actually be reduced in a reaction known as a reduction, which just means removal of oxygen. Now this happens at a very high temperature, and one example is iron oxide. Don't worry about this three. It's important to realize that iron can actually come in various different forms, okay? So iron three oxide, it's just an oxide of iron, plus carbon will give us carbon dioxide and iron. So we have now displaced the iron from its oxide and produced iron metal, and we have oxidized carbon to produce carbon dioxide. In the case of iron, this is carried out in a blast furnace. The reason for that is this reaction needs to occur at a high temperature. Now the iron normally produced from this has around about 96% purity. So it's around 96% iron, not 100%. And that is because different minerals will get in there and mix with the iron. One of those being carbon. Carbon will also get in there, but so will other things. Now the fact that we have carbon mixed into the iron actually makes the iron very brittle. That means if it was solid and you smashed it with a hammer, you could probably eventually crack it and break it apart. That is not ideal for some uses, but in other cases, you're not so bothered because this iron still has a massively high resistance to heat and it is also very strong and very hard to compress or change the shape of. That gives it ideal uses if we melt it down and we mould it into a shape that we want. So we get something called a cast, we pour this molten iron in, and then what we end up with is of course cast iron. And those moulds can be used in order to create these things here, which are manholes, and also things like this, which is a stove in which to burn wood. Now you might be asking yourself then, well, if we've got this downfall with the, with the brittle iron, why don't we remove all the impurities and then we'll have a much better metal? And the answer is we can remove those impurities, but it actually causes the iron to be way softer. The iron will not be as brittle, but it will be a lot softer, and so that actually detracts from a lot of the uses of iron. For example, if you had a manhole, which could be easily shaped into a different shape because it was so soft, every time a car drives over it, it will start to mould it and cause it to dent inwards. This is obviously not ideal at all, and so we don't actually use pure iron for very many things. What we will do, though, is control which impurities we put into a metal, and we'll form what we call an alloy. So we can think of an alloy as a mixture of a metal with at least one other element. And that means if you have iron, but within your iron you also mixed in some carbon, and maybe some nickel, which is another metal, you will have formed an alloy, not just a pure metal. And that is an example of a very famous alloy known as steel. And we've all heard of steel, but there are various different kinds of steel. But steel is iron plus carbon plus other elements. This is a broad definition because there are actually very few steels that won't contain carbon. All of them have iron in them, almost all of them will have carbon in them, and most of them will have other elements in them as well. Now the first type of steel is known as a carbon steel. Okay, carbon steel. And that is where you pretty much have iron and carbon. Plus carbon. Now remember we said that cast iron had around about 96% iron with about 4% of carbon in there. We don't call that carbon steel because it's cast iron. The steel will be formed when we actually remove some of the carbon. So what we have is a percentage of carbon in here which is lower. So it's around about, well there's a range of 0.03 to 0.05. 
to around about 1.5%. So we have a small amount of carbon, smaller than we did in cast iron, but we still have a lot of iron left. So if we had 1.5% carbon, then we probably have 98.5% iron. Now it's important to realise that the more carbon that you have in your steel, the stronger in general it's going to be. So if you had the upper end, so 1.5%, it's going to be a stronger steel than if you had 0.03%. However, the increased carbon makes it act more like cast iron, so it makes it more brittle and easier to smash. And another term we give the low carbon steel here is mild steel. Okay, mild steel. One very common use of mild steel is the bodies of cars. So cars actually don't want to have the hardest body that they can because that will cause more damage to the driver in the event of a crash. So using mild steel means that the steel can actually be bent into shape while still remaining fairly hard and strong. This means that in the event of a crash, the car will crumple and it prolongs the time of impact and therefore is safer for the driver. Finally, in general, the carbon steels are the cheapest forms of steel because we don't have to incorporate other metals. If we have to incorporate other metals into our steel, then of course we need to find that metal from somewhere and actually produce the steel as the end product. And those types of steels are known as alloy steels. Okay, alloy steels. Now even though carbon steel is an alloy, we stress these kinds of steels as alloy steels because they are including other metals as well. And there are two subsets of alloy steels, and they are low alloy and high alloy steels. Now a low alloy steel will contain around about 1-5% to other metals. So 1-5% to of the entire steel will not be carbon or iron, it will be something else. Now the metal that we add in depends on the property that we want out of our steel. For example, a nickel steel is very resistant to stretching forces. Now that's very useful in a number of scenarios, one of those being on a bicycle chain, so resisting stretching forces. If a bicycle chain were to stretch, then as you pedal faster, the chain would just stretch and you wouldn't really go very fast. There would then be a point where the chain would have stretched enough and it would either snap or you would just shoot forward. And that is of course not what you want to happen on a bicycle. So a nickel steel is a good choice there. They're also used um, in bridges because if a bridge could stretch then you're in big trouble. Now because we have to obtain these extra metals, for example nickel or tungsten or other metals like that, these alloy steels are expensive. Now a high alloy steel is one which will have more than 5% of the entire steel being a different substance than iron or carbon. As you are producing even more metal to go into the steel, these are even more expensive than your low alloy steels. So they are very expensive. Very expensive. And one common example that I do want you to remember is a chromium nickel steel. So you have chromium metal and nickel metal making up quite a high proportion of the steel. This is known, and it's very common, as stainless steel. These steels have the very unique property that they just will not rust. They resist corrosion very well, but they also retain the hardness and the strength that you associate with other kinds of steel. So we use those for cutlery for one, because we don't want our cutlery rusting, because that's not very hygienic at all. And in chemistry, we actually use them to line reaction vessels. So if you think of a beaker where you carry out a reaction, if you're carrying out a quite an extreme reaction and you need a very high temperature, you're not going to make it out of glass, you're going to make it out of something else. And one of those components is going to be stainless steel, or it can be stainless steel. That's because the chemicals within the beaker, or within the vessel, as we call it on a large scale, are not going to actually cause the stainless steel to corrode or react. 
So that means that the reaction in the vessel will not affect the vessel itself. And that is of course very important. So hopefully that's cleared up. Steels, what an alloy is, how we extract iron and what we can use it for, and also what we can't use it for. So of course, pure iron is not really that useful for us. It contains carbon when we extract it and we can use that to make cast iron. And the level of carbon within the iron dictates how hard it is. So when we produce steel, the amount of carbon will dictate how hard it is, but it also makes it brittle. So I hope you found this useful and I look forward to seeing you in the next video where we'll talk about aluminium and titanium.